great pleasure to um, introduce um, Simon Saunders. Again, if you're familiar with philosophy of physics, philosophy of physics, you're familiar with Simon's many contributions over the years. Um, and today he's going to uh, talk about issues of space and time in the context of Newtonian physics. Thank right. you. Thank you very much, Wayne, and thank you, Chris. Well, Chris, thank you for all of this and the organizers. Um, it's, uh, it's really lovely to be here. It's, it's especially um, significant for me to be here and to be giving this talk for reasons I'll explain. Uh, but let me just uh, in advance say I, I really am going through some very, very elementary things. So forgive me, physicists, who, um, uh, for whom it really is uh, too elementary. Um, uh, it's also non-relativistic. Again, forgive me those of you who um, see no real uh, source of uh, new ideas coming from non-relativistic theory. I suppose the one excuse for focus on non-relativistic theory is that I think there is a connection with quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, although in many ways has wonderful harmonies with relativity, as we know in relativistic quantum field theory, Nevertheless, nevertheless, there's strange incompatibilities or p possible incompatibilities as well. OK, so those are two excuses. Um, right, so what am I going to do? I'll start off with what I'm calling brown Knox functionalism. Uh, so this is a general program that Harvey Brown in particular has been promoting for uh, more than 25 years, actually. <coughs> Uh, but that came to a focus uh, in his book, Physical Relativity, published in 2005. Um, those of you who don't have it, uh, I urge you to get a copy. It's all right, I'm not a beneficiary of copyright. I, I won't get any money for it, but it's a wonderful book. Um, and I think the great strength of the book is it not only promotes a certain line about the nature of space-time geometry um, with philosophical argumentation, but it's backed up with a, a, a really a, a, a tremendously informed historical narrative. And that makes it extremely persuasive. It's very hard to be dismissive of a position when there are so many great figures in the history of physics who have said things that seem really very germane and in the same ballpark as what Harvey has been promoting. So what is it? Um, oh, oh, sorry, yes, and I'm including uh, Knox there because, uh, Eleanor Knox, because she in particular has um, focused on non-relativistic gravity. Uh, Harvey has spent very little time on the non-relativistic case. Um, can I put it like this? The target, the target is the view that space-time geometry is in and of itself explanatory of anything that we observe. <coughs> um, it's often backed up with rhetorical moves of the form, how do particles know about space-time geometry? Is it that space-time somehow comes with grooves that tell particles how to move? So there's a, there's a certain amount of, uh, I think it is brought roughly rhetorical. I, I don't mean to be critical of it in that way, but it, it's summoning up um, an intuitive conception that may be foreign to many of you. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't seem to me that someone who takes the view that space-time geometry is explanatory is thereby committed um, to, to that intuition. I, I mean, look, in many ways, geometry is or has always been the paradigm of explanation insofar as it fits diverse phenomena into a common framework a geometric framework. Uh, typically, we're talking about three-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, uh, it, it seems that by appealing to the structure of that space, it's immensely informative. Take Hilary Putnam's famous example. You're trying to drive a, a square peg into a round hole. Uh, what are you supposed to do? Give a dynamical analysis of the structure of the peg to explain why there's a problem? Or do you just point out, no, it's round, this thing is square, the one doesn't fit inside the other, one appeals to geometry. So um, I, I think it remains an ongoing tension in the community as to whether uh, it's quite right to uh, downplay or downgrade or, or deny that geometry can be explanatory. Um, but notice that I switched to three-dimensional geometry, uh, whereas the focus has largely been space-time geometry. 
So very much bound up with inertial motion and so forth. All right, let me give a brief summary of um, their views. And I haven't taken statements from their texts because I'm not sure that they've either of them given a one-liner that is really definitive. I've done my best. I'm not sure if this is quite right, but I've, I've done my best. Uh, broadly speaking, Harvey's view, I think, is that dynamics dictates space-time geometry and does not conform to it. OK. I think that's a, I'm pretty sure Harvey would agree with that. Whether he'd say, yes, that's a, you know, a good summary, I, I, I'm not sure. But he's, <laughs> he's not going to disagree with that, I think. Now, Elena um, has, in particular, championed the view that space-time geometry is something approximate and emergent, even in classical physics. <coughs> OK, uh, and I think, actually, Harvey's probably said something similar. Um, but Elena has, in particular, as I say, championed it in the context of non-relativistic physics, which is what I am considering today. Um, to understand why you might think that, um, here's the strong equivalence principle. And now this is a direct quote from Harvey, uh, from his book, Physical Relativity. Uh, there exists in the neighborhood of each event preferred coordinates called locally inertial at that event for each fundamental non-gravitational interaction to the extent that tidal gravitational effects can be ignored the laws governing the interaction find their simplest form in these coordinates. This is their special relativistic form, independent of space-time location. OK, so that's uh, a comment from Brown. Now, what's going on here? I think physicists, um, many physicists anyway, have the view that the equivalence principle it was a heuristic device um, th that was used to arrive at GR. And once you've got GR, you don't really need it anymore. I think that's a very common view. Um, Harvey has resisted that, uh, and Eleanor following him has resisted that. For, for them both, um, the strong equivalence principle is playing a central role in understanding the meaning of space-time geometry. <clears throat> so how come? The basic idea, I think now to Bell and his famous uh, uh, little um, poll that he did at CERN, deeply embarrassing to the physics community. Uh, I think everybody here knows it, but just briefly. Two, two rocket ships, <clears throat> one blasts off, the other blasts off after it. Uh, there's a thread connecting the two. Uh, the rockets are carefully um, monitored and supervised so to maintain the relative separation, the distance between the two rockets as they accelerate uh, relative to the ground frame of reference. Uh, what's happened? Does the thread uh, contract, Lorentz contract, uh, prevented from doing so because the rockets are required to maintain the separation? Does the thread break? Show of hands, please. Who thinks the thread breaks? <laughs> Who isn't sure? <laughs> Who says it doesn't break? Nobody says it doesn't break. OK. So um, yeah, the thread breaks. I, I think the sand physicists were 60-40 that it didn't break, uh, something like that. And what is going on there, I think, is very fascinating. Um, and we ought to have more understanding of what is, as it were, common knowledge within a community. Because here, clearly, there was not adequate common knowledge of, in, within the community of a very elementary feature of special relativity. And I think it was bound up with. Um, a perspectivalist view of what's going on with Lorentz contraction and time dilation effects. Um, and perspectivalism might suggest that in, in reality nothing happens, you're just changing your perspective upon it. But of course, really, it's no different from uh, if, if I rotate this pencil so as uh, to uh, maintain a constant angle subtended at your eye, of course, I've got to stretch it as I rotate it, and I'll pull it apart trying to do that eventually, right? So um, this is a very elementary observation. And it is a remarkable fact that so, so many um, serious physicists uh, got the wrong answer. So what is the relevance to uh, the strong equivalence principle? Um, the point is this. The Bell, uh, in the face of this, wrote his famous paper, How to Teach Special Relativity, wasn't it? Or Special Relativity for Cosmologists? I, I, sorry, I forgot the exact uh, title of his piece. Um, in which he uh, performed, a, did a dynamical analysis of a quasi-rigid body um, as it's being boosted, all relative to a single frame of reference, um, and showing the contraction effect as a dynamical effect. 
So this was um, the source of great inspiration for Harvey in his program. Uh, the idea being that uh, dynamics is responsible for things like length contraction and time dilation, uh, not space-time geometry. <coughs> okay, so uh, where does space-time geometry come from then? How does it arise? Answer, it arises um, from the symmetry group of the uh, non-gravitational dynamics. Okay. <coughs> um, Indeed, it had better be the symmetry group of the non-gravitational uh, dynamics, if you think of it, because what is the symmetry group of the gravitational dynamics? Answer the diffeomorphism group. So, you know, this is somehow really not anything able to ground uh, geometry in this sense. So, look at non-gravitational physics. Look at the symmetry groups of the interactions, um, and uh, really appeal to something like Klein's Erlangen program in geometry to argue that. Um, to call the local geometry Lorentzian is only a way of uh, co codifying that symmetry in the dynamical equations. Now, I think to do justice to this topic, I'd really have to go into some length as to what is Klein's Langan program exactly. Um, how is it that a, a symmetry group is going to specify to define a G space that carries the symmetry and thereby a geometry? Uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, I, my attention is elsewhere. Um, but just in terms of now the strong equivalence principle, you can start to see what's going on. It's only insofar as the non gravitational physics exhibits these symmetries um, that we can meaningfully speak of geometry at all. Now, that's a stretch. I, I, I'm not expecting people entirely to go along with that. One might think that, well, the point being that, of course, it's only locally that one has the strong equivalence principle satisfied, and indeed only up to an approximation. <coughs> so in a sense, the only place for geometry in um, brown Knox exegesis is uh, locally, insofar as you've got non-gravitational physics. <coughs> And the pushback on that is to think, well, grief, doesn't general relativity describe a rich and varied, uh, non-trivial curved geometry with an enormous amount of interesting curvature and structure and so on and so forth? <coughs> um, OK. Uh, yeah, so let me just say a little bit specifically on Eleanor's work. So Eleanor um, has embrace this terminology of functionalism. Um, I don't think that Harvey used it in his book. Um, and her starting point, apart from being Harvey's D. Phil student, of course, uh, her starting point is um, think of uh, inertial structure is that from which departures are to be explained um, by appeal to whatever forces, dynamics, and so forth. So in general, dynamics begins with a notion of natural motion, which does not need to be explained. It's the departures from it that need to be explained. <coughs> OK. Um, and from that point of view, um, her conclusion is that uh, in the light of GR, uh, really, it's departures from free fall that the dynamics is responsible for, that free fall is the natural state of motion. <coughs> um, so even in the non-relativistic case, one ought to be looking at the freely falling frames as defining inertial structure. Uh, and departures from those are what the dynamics, non-gravitational dynamics, is all about. OK. Now that, I think, is supposed to have, in part, an historical dimension to it. It's supposed to be, in part, an account of uh, any functional account of anything appeals to an antecedent usage of terms and expressions and so forth. And then functionalism is a philosophy that says, identify something that satisfies, that plays that role. <coughs> OK. And then presumably, the appeal uh, needs to be historical. It's talking about an antecedent understanding. And what is the antecedent understanding? I mean, one could go back to Aristotle. What is the natural state of, of, of anything? For Aristotle, it was a state of rest, a different place within the Aristotelian uh, cosmology 
um, depending on what the substance is, uh, fire, fire and water, and so forth. So, I, I think the problem, what it's kind of becoming clear, isn't it? What's a bit problematic about this? Where, where did we start to get a, a functional characterization? When can we start to talk meaningfully of a functional characterization of inertial motion? Well, presumably in the 17th century. But now look, uh, gravity was supposed to be an account of departures from that inertial motion. So to somehow put gravity, you know, say, oh, freely falling frames, those the natural state of motion, there seems to, I think there's some real tension there with um, the appeal to a broadly functionist philosophy. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm going to come back to these things, um, but just for now, notice that the strong equivalence principle is playing this role, that because it's only an approximate thing, inertial structure is only approximately defined uh, and indeed space-time geometry locally is only approximately defined in these ways. Right. What used to be the position prior to um, this formulation, this understanding, this whole approach to space-time geometry, which has become rather influential, I think. It's not, I would say, a dominant view, but it's certainly one of the main views within the philosophy of space-time community. The, um, the previous view uh, was articulated by John Ehrman very clearly in his beautiful book, um, Absolute or Relative Motion. <coughs> uh, and given a theory T, two principles, one, any dynamical symmetry of T is a space-time symmetry of T, and two, any space-time symmetry of T is a dynamical symmetry of T. So just this interrelating of space-time symmetry with dynamical symmetry. Re recall that I began with a... Um, I mean, I suppose it's a straw man in a way, the rhetorical move that says, how can particles know about space-time geometry? Um, the, had you posed that question to John Ehrman, um, or indeed Michael Friedman, uh, they would have, I think, said something like this. Well, of course, of course, space-time geometry is also the symmetry group of the dynamics. <coughs> um, and insofar as uh, people like Harvey were re reacting to a view in the literature, it was probably in Friedman's book on space-time um, where so much effort went into defining the space-time structure um, as somehow itself carrying with it all on its own, without any mention of the dynamics, um, uh, informative and explana explanatory information about things like Rent's contraction and time dilation. So it seemed that the antidote to that was merely to point out, well, of course, the dynamics is also going to code up that same, uh, that geometry in the sense of its symmetry group. So that would have been um, a, a, an immediate response. And indeed, it was my immediate response back in the early 90s when Harvey's first started to express um, <laughs> frustration, let's say, with what he saw as a neglect of dynamics. <clears throat> so um, one response, I think, in the light of um, what the, this general functionalist approach, um, Wayne, actually, where, where are you in there? Ah, oh, there's Wayne. So Wayne um, is, in, in a sense, making uh, the argument that these principles, they're not sort of arbitrary add-on principles. They're, they're actually constitutive of what we mean by space-time symmetry. The, uh, th these principles are, in, in fact, analytic truths, uh, which is how he's put it in a recent paper, um, that reflection on what we mean by space-time symmetry will lead us to the conclusion that it can only be that thing which is picked out and dictated by dynamical considerations. Can we have a quick clarification? Yeah, okay. Does John is what John Ehrman is saying, the phrase is saying that there's dynamics can be expressed in momentum space and that the symmetry of space time is also symmetry of momentum space. The, the, the dynamics can be rephrased on momentum space. On oh, momentum space. Because the statement that, that what we mean by a symmetry of dynamics is a symmetry of momentum space. Well, that's a very good question. Well, maybe we can take it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very nice question. Thanks for that. I've never thought of that before. That's an interesting question. It certainly doesn't seem that we speak of symmetry of momentum space, does it? Yeah. OK, but let me, let me carry on. OK, so um, I have some 
doubts that the right way to frame it is that um, what is meant by space-time symmetry can only be that which is somehow dictated by dynamical considerations. Um, this could be taken as a full-blown operationalist requirement that uh, all that can be meant by space-time symmetry is what can be measured using instrumentation, and the instrumentation must be governed by dynamics. So that would make it a very tight connection, but that would seem to require some sort of commitment to operationalism. Okay. Well, in a way, I'd like to just draw a line under all of that. This is background. Now I'm going to go to closer a closer look at Newtonian gravity and Newtonian mechanics. Um, and after a rather a long detour, I'll come back to, to these issues of a functional characterization um, of inertial structure. All right. So. Um, my starting point now, and this is why it gives me so much pleasure to be giving this talk here, because it was here in London, Western Ontario, I think seven years ago, that I first gave a talk on this topic in which I'd just been working out these ideas. And it was because of a favorable reception at that talk that I had, was encouraged to, and had the courage to write it up and publish it, because it did seem um, very contrary to established wisdom. Uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, people here at London for, for giving me that uh, encouragement. So, um, so it starts with uh, this famous moment in Principia where Newton finally discharges his um, avowed uh, intent in writing the book, which is to distinguish true from apparent motions. Um, this wonderful phrase with which he ends the scolium to the definitions. Um, it, it occurs in book three. Uh, it is one of the only, th I think, three hypotheses in the third edition of Principia. Um, Newton expunged lots of mentions of hypothesis in the third edition. He was, at this point, intent on uh, defending his position, which had come under quite a broad set of criticism, um, on the base of being induced from phenomena. You know, don't criticize me for invoking action at a distance. It's not a hypothesis. I've arrived at it inductively. But we have experts here who know so much more about this. Uh, it's a very fascinating um, episode in the history of physics. Uh, but anyway, there did remain, I think, th I think only two hypotheses, or is it three? Um, one of them was very obscure, something about the rings of Saturn. Anyway, here's this hypothesis, that the center of the system of the world is immovable, and that this is acknowledged by all. Okay, um, he's seeking consent. <laughs> uh, so yes, everybody would grant the center of the world is immovable. Um, but then immediately, proposition 11, that the common center of gravity of the Earth, the Sun, and all the planets is immovable. For by corollary four of the laws, that center either is at rest or moves uniformly forward in a right line. But if that center moved, the center of the world would move also against the hypothesis. So terribly elegant. You know, he's arrived at center of mass of the solar system is at rest. It's a bit of a trick. That should be obvious. But it's, uh, it's, it's a worse trick than uh, it, it. It's not merely because he's framed it in this way in terms of this hypothesis. It's a worse trick because when you look at corollary four, what it says, the common center of gravity of two or more bodies does not alter its state of motion or rest by the actions of the bodies among themselves, and therefore the common center of gravity of all bodies acting upon each other, excluding external action and impediments, is either at rest or moves uniformly in a right line. And of course the problem is, who says the solar system is not subject to external action? <clears throat> okay, if it were alone in the universe, he'd have a case. It's not alone in the universe. Um, Newton obviously knows that this is a bit flawed. Um, he goes on in Proposition 14. Uh, corollary 1 is interesting, that the fixed stars are, are immovable, seeing they keep the same position for the aphelia and nodes of the planets. Um, this is suggesting that the fixed stars don't actually play much of a role in the construction of Principia. Um, Bill, you'll perhaps correct me on that. It seems to me they probably did play a pretty important role, actually. It's not at all clear that there could have been a Newton 
on a planet Earth in a big cloud of dust so that you just don't see any stars. I, I, I really wonder, and it's a great counterfactual question, could it have been possible to arrive at Principia in such a situation without the backdrop of the fixed stars? But anyway, I think once he has arrived at the construction using the fixed stars, it's fair comment that he deduces the aphelion nodes of the orbits. These are the extreme, if you think of elliptical orbits, um, the aphelia are the, uh, <laughs> the two tips of the egg, if you like, <laughs> of the ellipse. So uh, um, the two tips of the ellipse. Uh, and the nodes are at the intersection of the elliptical orbits with the plane of the ecliptic. So those should be fixed subject to perturbations. There are perturbations from the various planets. But surely you can determine, and it's like a consistency check, isn't it, that indeed the fixed stars are not in motion, relative motion, uh, relative to the aphelia and nodes. Um, but corollary two is where he betrays his understanding that, oh, well, gosh, maybe uh, the solar system isn't actually screened off from the rest of the universe. He says, since these stars are liable to no sensible parallax, so they're very, very far away, <coughs> uh, they can have no force because of their immense distance, not to mention the fixed stars everywhere promiscuously dispersed in the heavens by their contrary actions destroy their mutual actions. Okay. So that's just um, a, a flat-out error in a large enough universe. I think there's every reason to think that Newton believed in an island universe. Uh, I don't know of textual evidence for that. Again, Bill may be able to help me. Um, in his correspondence um, uh, w about, about the, the issue of what is the status of the fixed stars vis-a-vis -vis their gravitational influence, he invoked divine action. <coughs> so he surely understood that in accordance with his system, the stars would gravitate. Um, but I believe he thought, while space was infinite, um, the distribution of stars was finite. <clears throat> and if it was small and finite, this comment would be perfectly appropriate. But if it isn't finite, <clears throat> then, of course, <clears throat> here's the solar system. Uh, so take a, a, a shell of stars whatever the density is, <coughs> uh, the action of the shell of stars falls off as the inverse square. <coughs> so we've got r dr times the density of stars. Um, so uh, r dr times 4 pi r squared. What do I want? Um, uh, uh. Um, OK, times rho, that's going to be the total mass. Um, and the 1 upon r squared fall off just cancels. <clears throat> if you're going to integrate over all of r, you're integrating, depends on what rho is, of course, and if rho is constant, you're integrating a constant over all of r, and the contribution is going to diverge. So um, and this, of course, is familiar also from um, Elber's paradox, so-called. <clears throat> Uh, anyone know who was the first to articulate Elber's paragraph? Elber's paradox. Kurt. Oh. Who? Andrew Allan Poe. No. <laughs> <laughs> he was the first one to solve it. That was that's the claim. Alan, Alan Poe did have a solution. That's interesting. Now, who was the first to articulate it? Was Kant? Kant? No. It was it Elber? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it was certainly not Elber. Oh, interesting. So. Um, so it was Kepler was the first known to have hinted at it. It was only a few lines. Um, the next person that I know to have written on it um, was Halley. <clears throat> and he wrote on it and published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in 1728. And it's fascinating because he sets out the argument, but he doesn't draw the conclusion. He sets out the basics and he says, and those Oh, I forget the exact words. And those with an eye to see can deduce the conclusion. You know, he leaves it for the... He gave this paper, he delivered this paper at the Royal Society. Guess who was the president sitting in the chair? Isaac Newton. <coughs> so um, I'm pausing about this because I think it's something that happens in physics. And if you can find it, pay attention. It's a moment where somebody comes out with something that is clearly... Paradoxical, somehow unacceptable, uh, 
Nobody knows what to do with it, so they just park it and forget about it and ignore it. And this is a terrible mistake. Um, but it's very understandable, it's very human. So nobody knew what to do with this paradox. The years went by, and then it was resurrected again by Olbers and so forth. So. Okay, now, um, actually Newton had a much better answer to, oh, sorry, I mean, one sort of answer to this, of course, would be, well, what happens if the solar system's at the center of mass of the universe? Obviously a bad response. Okay, we're not returning to an Aristotelian conception. <coughs> but Newton had a much better answer, and I, I don't really understand why he didn't make it clear. He did make it clear in his System of the World, um, which he wrote before he wrote Principia, and which is usually included now in the English translations of Principia um, as a kind of long appendix. Uh, so here he says, uh, he goes, looks at this very thing, it may be alleged that the sun and planets are impelled by some other force equally and in the direction of parallel lines, but by such a force, by corollary six of the laws of motion, no change would happen in the situation of the planets one to another, nor any sensible effect follow. But our business is with the causes of sensible effects. Let us therefore neglect every such force as imaginary and precarious and of no use in the phenomena of the heavens. By the heavens, I think he means the solar system. Okay, so what is corollary six? Corollary five, by the way, was the relativity principle. Corollary six, if bodies moved in any manner among themselves are urged in the direction of parallel lines by equal accelerative forces, they will all continue to move among themselves after the same manner as if they had not been urged by these forces. Okay, <clears throat> so what is the point here? Uh, the point is this. Um, Consider the influence of the rest of the universe uh, and let the universe be anisotropic. Uh, it may be very large and finite. If it's small and finite, of course, we've got the, we'll, we'll, the forces will be negligible. But if it's large and finite, anisotropic, so maybe there's a large gravitational field in this direction. <coughs> now, it's gravity evoke the weak equivalence principle. <clears throat> because it's gravity, the weak equivalence principle ratio of inertia for gravitational mass is constant, independent of the composition of the substance. So all of the particles, all of the bodies, all of the materials, all of the substances in the solar system will accelerate uniformly. <clears throat> and by corollary six, their motion among themselves will not be disturbed. Okay, their motions among themselves will be exactly the same. Um, Newton, of course, knew all about the weak equivalence principle and spent some pages on it in volume three, beginning of Principia. <clears throat> um, why? Well, he sp specifically, I mean, it's interesting, corollary six has been very largely ignored, not by, by uh, uh, De DeSalle, is Robert DeSalle here? Yeah, he's here. Oh, good, oh, I'm glad. So Robert is one of the very few people who um, has, has written on this. Uh, Julian Barber famously dismissed it why is this thing sitting there with these other corollaries that are so important? It's just really a trivial thing. Um, uh, Harvey, despite my repeated insistence that he put it in his book, also ignored it, so um, it's a little frustration. But anyway, so uh, uh, Newton is partly to blame because the only place where he evoked corollary six was in book one, and that was in some fairly, in proofs that were later used so you had to sort of check back the proofs to see where corollary six came in. But a quick understanding of why he needed it, look at the Jupiter system. He applied his laws to the Jupiter system as though they were alone in the universe, in an inertial frame. But of course, they're not. They're subject to the gravitational field of the sun. <clears throat> OK. Now, I, I want to move on now to the, the next chapter where I think corollary six more or less was implicit or explicit, um, and this is with the notion of an inconsistency in Newtonian cosmology um, that uh, was first published by Zeelinger. So this is a little bit like Olber's paradox. Um, when do you have the courage to, to go into print um, with, with something like this? And Zeelinger was the man, immensely respected, doyen of German astronomy, uh, he, he could take the chance. <clears throat> so what was the point? So the point is this, that 
try to do cosmology. We try, try to do cosmology, and what we've been looking at, of course, are cosmological considerations. Um, take take an arbitrary point, <coughs> call it R zero. Consider an arbitrary point um, at distance uh, R from it. Suppose you've got a uniform mass distribution, <coughs> and suppose it's infinite. Um, first off, suppose it's finite, and it's a perfect sphere centered on R0. In that case, we can ignore, as goes the gravitational action on this point, uh, all, of the, all of the mass outside of the sphere that I just indicated. Okay, that's the famous uh, one of Newton's propositions, uh, that the gravitational field vanishes inside a spherical cavity within a sphere. <coughs> So in that case, the only action on this point will be the action of the mass contained within the sphere, which will just be 4 thirds pi r cubed <coughs> times the density divided by r squared. So 4 thirds times g. So 4 thirds pi g r. And that will equal r double dot. <coughs> Let me put in, make it a bit more precise what I'm doing here. So r minus r zero equals r double dot. I don't need to put the r zero. OK, so fine. So this particle will gravitate towards the center of this sphere. But of course, r zero was arbitrary. So what is the acceleration? <coughs> acceleration is supposed to be absolute, Newtonian gravity. But now it seems there can be no determinant acceleration. <coughs> Go to a, an infinite uh, cosmology. Um, and then, of course, it seems you can draw any sphere any way you want and we'd reproduce this argument. Uh, <coughs> so what's going on? <coughs> well, in face of this, um, I've given a list of people who followed on from Zeelinger. Uh, actually, Zeelinger, did, he did do something else as well. It's something I'll come back to. Um, Oh, I think I'd better give the, the, the solution. This list of people that followed on from him uh, made the observation, well, this may be indeterminate, the absolute acceleration. But if I consider two such particles, R1 and R2, then I can, whatever I choose as my R0, I can look at the, sub, the subtract the accelerations one from the other. And then I get R1 double dot minus R2 double dot is equal to I've left out so I've left out rho, haven't I? <coughs> is equal to four thirds pi rho g r one minus r two. <coughs> okay. So what is this? This is saying any two particles in an infinite Newtonian universe are going to be uh, subject to a relative acceleration, just proportional to their separation. Right? So this should have been a prediction from Newtonian cosmology. Uh, that we live in an expanding universe or a collapsing universe. <coughs> um, it could have been predicted at Newton's time. Now, what a magnificent, magnificent prediction that would have been. <laughs> um, but, and this, this is another very interesting story about uh, cosmology. Um, the community was unable to look this squarely in the face, this issue of potentially a dynamical universe. This was kind of just unthinkable. Even though Ptolemy had noted that there's some variation in the stars, uh, the famous uh, nova uh, that was observed, um, I think it was by Kepler, wasn't it? Uh, sorry, I'm losing my names and dates, but in the 17th century. I mean, there was awareness that the, the heavens, the stars in the sky were not, were subject to change. <coughs> But nobody was prepared to squarely face the possibility that they, the universe as a whole could be dynam dynamically changing. And this despite every major religion um, having its own myth mythical account of creation. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a very extraordinary thing. Um, paralleled by a resolute avoidance of the subject of what on earth is the Milky Way. I mean, people just didn't talk about the Milky Way, didn't comment on the Milky Way, didn't speculate about the Milky Way right up until the late, the late 17th century. And really, it wasn't until the 18th century that any serious commentary was forthcoming. Um, uh, Kant, of course, was uh, an early 
uh, speculation that the Milky Way consists of a disk of stars seen from within. <coughs> um, Lambert, another example, uh, but Kant published anonymously. Lambert's text was virtually unread. Um, it wasn't until Herschel that uh, there was a serious attempt to come to grips with the Milky Way. Um, right through the 19th century, there were debates as to whether it was the entire universe, whether it was even made of stars. I mean, this seems extraordinary today. You resolve through Herschel's telescope, you resolve the nebula, you find stars, but Herschel, what he was finding is um, you increase the power of the telescope, you've still got unresolved nebula. So rather than draw the obvious conclusion, well, you just need a bigger telescope, um, somehow the conclusion was, well, maybe it's not made of stars after all. Quite extraordinary. Right up until you know the great debate, so-called, of 1918, 19, was it? There still was the debate as to whether the solar system, the universe consisted of the Milky Way and essentially nothing else, or whether other nebulae, uh, not in the plane of the Milky Way, but away from it, might themselves be distant and remote structures. <coughs> it was Hubble, and only with Hubble, that the issue was finally resolved. Quite remarkable. <coughs> um, so anyway, um, the troubled history of cosmology. Um, and may I just say, Stanley Jackie, I don't know if anybody here knows his writings, um, I think a Jesuit, but a remarkable man who is pretty un unremarked on by the philosophy uh, of physics community, wrote a series of books, tremendous scholarship. I really recommend it. <coughs> OK, um, now let me. Uh, just add a little bit more now. In terms of a potential formulation, um, this, this sort of observation got codified fairly straightforwardly. I may need, need a crib ship. If I can put it in terms of, uh, so the velocity time derivative equal to um, the gradient of um, the potential. <coughs> um, so the uh, if, you, if you're looking at uh, uh, the gradient now, K, K I. <clears throat> so if, we, if we're thinking of dust and we're looking at the ge geodesic deviation of dust particles from one another, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, so what do I want? Um, uh, K delta, delta, I should have this, uh, no, I guess I want this here. <clears throat> okay, um, so, uh, and of course we've got um, that div squared phi is equal to 4 pi g rho, the Poisson equation. <clears throat> um, now, you look at this system of equations, um, and you find that it's in, so it, it transforms under a wider symmetry group. X goes to uh, X plus an acceleration, an arbitrary function of the time. And of course, you can have a rotation. Let me not bother with that. As long as the potential transforms to v plus um, the second derivative of this function uh, plus plus something, I forget. Um, yeah, plus a veloc plus a velocity. Yeah, plus v t. Right. <coughs> <coughs> So there's a wider group of transformations um, on a potential-based formalism. Um, and this is what is typically used in understanding the notion of uh, Newtonian gravity is about relative accelerations. OK. <clears throat> now, let, let me come on to my, my own contribution. So my, my contribution was simply to observe that if we look at the difference equations, so rather than uh, write down Newton's laws uh, in the form in this form. <clears throat> okay, so rather than the system of this form, write them down as in difference equations. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
OK. Um, so this system of equations, there's a half n, n minus 1 of them, not all linearly independent, of course, together with the equation for the center of mass, Uh, is equivalent to the original system of equations that we began with. Okay, now this system of equations is invariant under a much wider, wider symmetry group reminiscent of this. Um, I'm not doing a potential based formalism, namely symmetries x goes to x plus arbitrary functions of the time. <coughs> okay, and this equation, my proposal was just get rid of it, forget about it. <coughs> So the entire theory consists of these difference equations invariant under these transformations, <coughs> whereupon the space-time structure required for the theory no longer includes affine structure. <coughs> okay, you're throwing away the principle of inertia altogether, but the claim is that this is empirically adequate <coughs> um, and that we can do not just gravity, but any classical mechanical theory uh, so long as, and rather crucial, is that the force function um, uh, changes sign on, so the third law is obeyed, equal and opposite reaction. Okay. So. Oh my gosh, oh, I'm terribly late. Oh, well then I'm, I've really got to skip a lot. Oh dear, goodness me. Um, okay, so, so this was my proposal. All right. Um, and it gives us a much uh, impoverished space-time structure, um, but it seems to be empirically adequate, adequate to Newtonian gravity, adequate to classical mechanics. That was the proposal. Um, and may I just say, if you look at what that space-time structure is that is required, if you look at, say, the relative velocities, so if I look at vi minus vj, um, so treat these now as vector quantities, <coughs> So this is going to be just x at t plus delta t xi minus x at t 1 over delta t minus the same thing for xj uh, at t plus delta t minus xj at t 1 over delta t as well. But we're looking at the whole expression what the point about this is it can be rearranged so that it is basically this this term minus so it's this term minus this term okay what this requires, this is a vector defined at a single instant of time, a spatial direct vector. This term is a spatial vector at another instant of time. The comparison must make sense. You, it must be meaningful to talk about comparing one spatial vector at one time with another spatial vector at another time. So uh, David Wallace has given, therefore, the name to this general program, uh, vector relationism. I didn't give it a name. I gave a name to the space-time background that was required, namely that made give you a basis for comparing spatial vectors at different times. I called that Maxwell Huygens space-time because Huygens had advanced a very similar view about rotations. This is right at the end of his life. I, I'm going to skip it now because I'm running out of time. Uh, Newton actually met with Huygens just towards the end of his life, and I have no doubt that Huygens attempted to persuade him of this point of view. Um, but anyway, let that go. So uh, the entire theory now is one that involves only uh, relations among particles at an instant of time and comparisons of spatial vectors at different times. So I think this is a thoroughgoing relationalism, not as thoroughgoing as Julian Barber's. Julian Barber's, of course, um, dispenses with the, a comparison of spatial vectors at different times. There's no such comparison possible for him. So in his way of thinking, you've got a pack of cards. Each one of them is a relative configuration. Um, there's no relative orientation between the cards when they're stacked. That isn't a datum. Okay. You reconstruct 
from best matching condition uh, a sequence of the configurations. You can then simplify the description in such a way as to give you back the original formulation with total angular momentum zero only. Of course, within my framework, I recover the entire sector of Newtonian gravity in classical mechanics, um, not just total zero angular momentum. All right, so that's sort of where things ended until along comes David Wallace and two recent papers of his, neither of them published yet. Uh, and he made some key observations. So one of them concerns um, boundary conditions. Um, I think I'm going to have to skip this because I've run so much out of time, and I'm sorry about that. But um, the point about the Newton-Cartan theory and this way of reformulating uh, theory of gravity in terms of relative accelerations is um, you need boundary conditions. <clears throat> uh, without them, the theory is wholly underdetermined. Now, normally, that's just what people stick in. They consider symmetrical matter distributions. The symmetry dictates a choice of boundary conditions. And you get out the usual Newton-Cartan uh, theory. Um, using my vector relationalism, you actually get an expression for what in GR would be the vial tensor, um, which is this term. Uh, and that gives you a natural boundary condition um, which makes the theory determinate. So that's a plus for this theory. It does better than Newton-Cartan theory. Unfortunately, David went on to show that it actually yields, uh, for certain models, um, predictions at variance with the non-relativistic limit of GR. This is Bianchi type 1 spacetimes. So he calls the paper then, his paper on this, you know, where am I? Uh, more problems for Newtonian cosmology rather than a resounding success for Newtonian cosmology. <laughs> uh, I, 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 he's somewhat hesitant to draw the conclusion, actually, if you look at the text, and there may be more work possible on that. Uh, there may be something rescued. But it does seem that this theory that I'm offering is at variance with GR in the non-relativistic limit. That may or may not um, be very bad news. It's certainly not good news. Um, OK, now the other. Uh, the other observation that he made is something that um, may or may not be obvious to you. Let me write it down. Consider the kth particle in a collection of n particles and consider the center of mass. Look at the double derivative. What does this thing equal? Just apply the, these equations. It's fun to do it. I mean, just take a simple model, you know, three particles or something, and do it. Uh, I don't know if it's obvious to you. It wasn't obvious to me. Uh, but I've been kicking myself ever since, because what it equals equals this. Oh, sorry. OK, there's a remarkable set of cancellations that takes place. Now choose your coordinate system so that it's uh, origin, a non-rotating system. We can make sense of rotation, remember. A non-rotating coordinate system with origin at the center of mass. In those coordinates, well, let me multiply through by mk. What do we get? We just get Newton's laws. <clears throat> OK, so that's, um, I don't know whether it's obvious or not. <laughs> it's, I sort of feel it ought to be obvious. Um, but uh, for I, anyway, had to work it through to actually believe it. <clears throat> now, what that is telling us is that, in a certain sense, this pushes us right back to Newton's original methodology. Um, if we think that in writing down his laws, he's saying, let there be a, a system of the world, absolute space or an inertial frame, such that these equations are valid. Do you write down these equations? 
Now let's figure out what is the coordinate system in which these equations are valid. Answer the center of mass coordinate system. That's precisely what he did. But we've arrived at these system of equations not as the fundamental geometry at all. We've arrived at them as a geometry that is only manifest, only explicit, only exhibited with a certain choice of coordinate system. <coughs> Right, the fundamental geometry is with no inertial structure. Right. So, I mean, to, to, to convey uh, another kind of significance of this, suppose we've got two collections of bodies. <clears throat> and let's consider the rest of the universe. Let's imagine that their interactions with each other are vanishingly small. And let's suppose that their interactions with the rest of the universe are such that are universal gravitational, weak equivalence principle applies, then I can uh, work out the internal motions of these guys within themselves. And in terms of the special coordinate system for this guy, I get Newton's laws holding for this system. For the special coordinate system for this guy, I get Newton's laws, Newton's laws holding for this system. But these two inertial frames are not inertial with respect to one another. OK? There is no uh, global inertial frame in the setting. Well, you could, if you, if you, in an infinite distribution, there is no global inertial frame. There is no Galilean relativity, no inertial structure at the fundamental level. There's an effective space-time, uh, an effective uh, inertial structure here, an effective inertial structure here, and the two are not equivalent because these two are in relative accelerations with one another vis-a-vis -vis the mass of the rest of the universe. Okay, so this is very much how David Wallace has put it. <coughs> Motion of inertial frame, though useless when applied to the universe as a whole, has a clear operational significance when applied to an isolated subsystem of the universe. Uh, there is no need for such frames in the formulation of the theory, no need, that is, for Galilean space-time as a background for the theory, but they emerge naturally for subsystems, defined dynamically by the distribution of everything not in the system. And that's absolutely right. I'm with him on this. And notice how it makes sense of Eleanor's uh, formulation of what is inertial structure um, in terms of Newton-Cartan theory and freely falling frames. This will be a freely falling frame. This will be a freely falling frame, not equivalent, no global inertial structure. OK, but I want to make another point. Um, David also. Your last point. I know, it's going to be my last point. I mean, David, um, uh, <clears throat> and elsewhere, it says, look, there's, there's, there's no use for inertial structure if you're looking at, say, the universe as a whole. <clears throat> but that's not quite right. I mean, it seems to me, anyway, this is my last point. What this is telling us, we can take a system of bodies. We define inertial structure by choosing the specific coordinate system in which the center of mass is zero. <clears throat> um, now, if I take a test particle, I can imagine this test particle is subject to Newton's laws with an effective inertial structure due to this system of bodies. <clears throat> Work through the equations, so put, put, work through the equations here <coughs> um, for x com. Exclude from x com this particle in question. Okay, so use, figure out the center of mass for all of the other particles that you've got, all the other bodies. Um, and what you get is, so this is as it were, these other bodies are all defining the inertial frames. <coughs> Uh, this one is subject to Newton's laws, and the equation that's satisfied is this. So can I put R for reduced center of mass uh, equals alpha over mk, sum of the forces. Choose a coordinate system for this center of mass excluding the kth particle. So you then have mk over alpha xk double dot equal to the usual equations. What is alpha? Alpha is 1 minus mk over m. <clears throat> so you get a, a correction to the mass, uh, but otherwise you've got an effective inertial frame structure uh, which is not incorporating the kth particle. So you can imagine this effective inertial structure as, as being held constant when xk can be placed anywhere you like, 
uh, moving anyhow you like, but just with this correction to its mass. <clears throat> and you can do the same game with two or three or four particles. Of course, if all of the particles are small in mass in comparison to the total mass, the center of mass of the entire system of bodies, take the solar system, then approximately you can just write down Newton's laws for, you know, I mean, this correction will be negligible. That's the point. A negligible correction. <clears throat> okay, well, I have run out of time. Forgive me for going on um, uh, a bit longer than I thought. So. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs>